let's look a little more closely at what you can do with an SDL decomposition. Firstly, SDL stands for seasonal and trend decomposition using low S. Low S is a form of smoothing based on locally linear regressions. That's a, SDL is a very versatile and robust tool. Um, and in particular, it will handle any type of seasonality, not just monthly or quarterly data, unlike X12 or, uh, or seats, which are restricted to monthly or quarterly data. The seasonal component can change over time and you can control that, how quickly it changes over time. And the trend cycle can also be controlled, how wiggly that thing is. You can also make it robust to outliers if that's necessary. On the other hand, there are some things that X12 Arima and Seats can do that STL can't do, including trading day and calendar adjustments or handling exogenous variables. Also, STL is only an additive method. There is no multiplicative variation of it. Although as we've, as we've seen, you can make something multiplicative by firstly taking logs and then fitting an additive decomposition. Also, if you use that approach, you can go somewhere between additive and multiplicative by using a box box transformation somewhere between with lambda somewhere between zero and one. So let's look at an example that we've uh, we've looked at before with other methods of decomposition. But let's see now what more things we can do with STL. I'll switch to R, and we'll uh, load the packages, and we'll create the data set that we've been using throughout this chapter. Now, the standard sort of default form of STL is what we've got here. We just take the data set, um, we pipe it into model, then the STL function and the employed series. And that gives us a decomposition, which is usually pretty good, um, but not necessarily perfect. Let's put in the extra bracket to make that work. Okay, so what else could we do? So we can control the seasonal pattern. So you can see there the seasonal patterns changing over time. Suppose we don't want it to change over time. Suppose we want to make it so that it stays um, fixed over time. We can say, let's make the seasonal pattern periodic. And then we get the same pattern throughout um, every year. It doesn't change from year to year. Or we might want it to change more slowly than it than it was doing before. So we can make that a number. We can make that say the number, let's say 49, um, which means that it's now going to, when it, when it averages the seasonal patterns um, to form the moving average of seasonal components, it's going to use um, a window of 49 years, which is you know, more years than we've got here. But because of the weighting, we do see some small variations over time. Yeah, you can hardly see the difference across there. But if I make this a smaller number, then we get a little more variation. So you now see that the end of the series, the end of the seasonal component down here is now looking quite different from the seasonal component at the start. If I make it really small, let's go maybe down to five, we'll see that there's now quite a lot of change in the seasonal pattern. So this, this pattern here is now changing a lot faster and um, is a lot more different from what you've got at the start. So the seasonal, the change in the seasonal pattern can be controlled with that window argument. Let's set it back to something a little more moderate like that. And we can also change the trend. So here we have a pretty smooth trend. We could make that trend much more wiggly by making the window for trend a small number. Again, let's do something really small. Um, so what's happening when it's doing the trend calculation is it's using um, windows of, of length five for removing averages. Um, so it's now quite a wiggly thing because the, you know, the seasonally adjusted data, which it's averaging, is, um, you know, is moving around a lot with, with a window that small. But if I make this a really big number, let's make it huge so you can see what happens. Um, then that, the, the trend becomes a straight line. Um, but then you get the remainder looking strange because what should have gone into the trend is no longer captured by the trend because this window is too big. And so it ends up in the remainder. So you see a lot of structure in the remainder, which you not, don't normally want to do. So having a more moderate trend um, hopefully will give us something that's sort of smooth in the trend and capturing most of the interesting variation, 
and all of the uninteresting noise ends up in the remainder, but there's no strong structure in the remainder. So you can play with these. The default values usually work pretty well though. Another argument that's in here is the robust argument. Um, you can say you want a robust fit and then it will down weight sort of unusual observations. So they don't have an effect on the final result. In this case, there aren't any really unusual observations. So it shouldn't have too much of an effect. So that's the robust version. If I go back to the non-robust version, you can see that it's mostly having an effect around here. And that's because of this drop, um, this drop in the series uh, through here. Um, and the remainder term is not really picking it up very well. So that's becoming sort of more extreme values in the remainder. And so when you downweight them, it, it does an even worse job actually in that particular period. Um, so robust is not always desirable. Um, sometimes you want it and sometimes you don't. The default is false. Okay, we can change, smoothly change the window just to see how it changes the seasonal pattern over time. So if I just concentrate on the season component, the third panel there, and I'm just going to run this forward as an animation and you'll watch it change. It's going to start with window five and it's just going to slowly increase. And as it increases, you'll see that the pattern is becoming more, um, more even in the seasonal comp component. The remainder starts off sort of jumping around all over the place because it's trying to deal with the fact that it's um, some of the noise is being picked up in the seasonal pattern when you have a seasonal window too small. Um, let's go back and do that again. So you, you see when the window is really small, um, the remainder is also a bit of a mess. Um, partly that's because the trend has been set too big here. Um, if I run with, if I run it forward, then this is slightly getting more even, the trend is getting more reasonable and the remainder sort of settles down to something that should be just noise and not trend and season. Um, so in this case, you do want a relatively high window because there isn't that much change in the pattern across time. So just to summarize, the window argument in the trend um, in the trend part of this controls the wiggliness of the trend component. And because it's using low S, it's doing weighted um, least squares fits. So it's looking at windows um, and fitting straight lines to them. So if the smaller the window, the fewer observations are being included when it's fitting the, the local linear line for the trend component. And for the seasonal component, uh, similar, except instead of looking at um, sections of the data, it's looking at the same component in consecutive years. So the window is talking about how many years you're going to use in estimating each of the seasonal components for each time period. And then if you set window to be periodic, it's the same as setting window to be infinite. Um, it will give you something where the seasonal pattern does not change over time. Um, and if you just leave it alone, you usually get something that's pretty good. Uh, the defaults are good for SDL um, and it gives you a nice smooth trend component, sufficiently changing seasonal pattern to pick up what's there in the data and everything else is in the remainder. Um, just uh, in case you're wondering what is it doing by default, so it's choosing 13 for the seasonal component. Um, we've just found with experiments that that seems to be a reasonable number for a lot of data sets. Um, the SDL function will allow you to put transformations in. So if you wanted to do an SDL on the log, you just put a log employed here and it will take care of the transformation for you. The um, Just going to the bottom of the screen first, the default trend is given by this expression here. So the default window for season is 13. The default window for trend is given by this expression, a little more complicated, and it depends on the seasonal window. So this S dot window here is the seasonal window that it uses. Generally, though, it tends to pick pretty good values. Um, so how does STL actually work? So we're not going to do any of the details in this book, um, but just briefly, it updates the trend and the seasonal components iteratively. So it starts off by saying, well, let's suppose there's no, there's no trend. Um, and then it will try to estimate the seasonality by doing something a little bit like what happens in classical decomposition to estimate those seasonal patterns. 
and then it removes that and tries to estimate the trend using a low S curve, a, a smooth locally linear curve. And then it removes that and then tries to do the seasonal term again. And it iterates between those two, successively getting more accurate or, or better refined estimates of both trend and seasonal components. Um, so the trend window is controlling the bandwidth applied to the deseasonalized values. The season windows are controlling the bandwidth applied to the detrended subseries. Um, and if you say robust, then it's taking the remainder series and it's looking to see how um, extreme they are. So you know, if it's more than a few standard deviations from zero, then it's going to downweight those values. And that's it. That's how STL works. If you want more detail about the algorithm, uh, the link to the original paper is in the at the end of the chapter in the book. <laughs>